sense as two angels, univos, but only in a highly unique manner, because an infinite and a finite essence, an uncreated and a created spirit, differ in every respect plus quam toto hinere. Gerhard, Locke. CIT, Luther therefore says very correctly, who knows what God is? He is above body, spirit, yes, above everything that we can say, hear, or think, street hell. 20 806. Strictly speaking, then, a definition of God is impossible. But we can and should formulate a description of God. In accord with the attributes which God ascribes to Himself in His Word, we can and should describe Him as the One, Simple, Immutable, Almighty, Omnipresent, Just, Gracious God, etc. In reality the entire scriptures are a description of God, we subscribe to the maxim, Deus non definiri, sed ex verbo suo revelato describe potest. Would to God that we would at all times make diligent use of this description. 2. The Simplicity of God, Simplicitas Dei. We can describe God's simplicity only in negative terms. It is that attribute according to which God exists entirely uncompounded and without parts. The infinitude of God permits of no parts. But does Scripture not ascribe to God members, e, g, eyes, mouth, hands, feet, and thereby teach that He is compounded of parts? The Scriptures compel us to understand such passages as Ps. 139-16, eyes, is. 55-11, mouth, Psalms 119-73, hands, mat. 535, feet, figuratively, anthropopathically, anthropomorphically. This is evident especially from John 4:24, where Christ corrects the Samaritan woman's external and corporeal concept of God by declaring, God is incorporeous, impartiabilis, Augustana, art. I. We therefore reject anthropomorphism, which ascribes corporeity and materiality to God, 72 and also the dream of modern theosophists, Udinger, d. 1782, of a spiritual body, gay salib, which was solidified in and by the creation of the world. 73 But does Scripture not become involved in a contradiction when it ascribes to God both simplicity and a plurality of attributes? True, God is one, indivisible, uncompounded, for, as was shown above, all the divine attributes are God's indivisible being. But this is simply beyond all human comprehension. Therefore, God Himself has condescended to us, divided Himself, as it were, into component parts, and because of our finite intellect permits us to conceive of God's attributes, e, g, justice, omnipotence, grace, as following one after another or as existing alongside one another. This is a knowledge of God in part, as St. Paul says 1 Corinthians 13. Ancient and modern Unitarians charge that there is an irreconcilable conflict between the triad of persons and the unity and simplicity of God. Scripture answers this objection by stating that the essence of God is not divided among the three persons, but that the entire divine essence is without any division, or multiplication, or distinction in the Father, in the Son, Colossians 2 9, and in the Holy Ghost, Acts 5 3 4. But the Unitarians contend that a real, and not only a notional, distinction between the persons must lead to tritheism, and they therefore do away with the unity and simplicity of God. Our answer is, here we are confronted with the mystery of the Holy Trinity. On the basis of Scripture we believe both the unity of God and the Trinity of Persons, 1 Corinthians 8 4-6, Matt. 28 19. Subordinationists, indeed, by subordinating the Son to the Father and the Holy Ghost to the Father and the Son, deny the unity and simplicity of God and become polytheists. 3. The immutability of God, immutabilitas day. The psalmist brings into the sharpest possible contrast the change and decay to which all creatures are heir in the immutability of God when he says, They shall perish, but thou shalt endure, yea, all of them shall wax old like a garment, as a vesture shalt thou change them, and they shall be changed, but thou art the same, and thy years shall have no end, Psalms 102 26-27. God is unchangeable in his essence. He is immutable also in all his attributes, e, g, his kindness, is. 54:10 His wrath John 3:36 His will Proverbs 19:21 The counsel of the Lord shall stand Scripture draws a twofold lesson from God's immutability 1 to warn the wicked because God's wrath is unchangeable Mark 9:44 2 to comfort the pious because God's grace can never depart is 54:10 When Scripture ascribes to God change of mind Genesis 6:6 1 Sam 15:11 Jonah 3:10 or change of place Genesis 11:5 it does so to conform to our mode of thinking in terms of time and space cause and effect 
but God is above these, and therefore no change or mutation can be predicated of God's essence. Scripture teaches this very clearly in all those passages in which God and man are placed into sharp antithesis, for example, in 1 Sam. 15:29, God is not a man that he should repent. God enters into time and space without becoming temporal or local in his essence, Jeremiah 23:24. Scripture speaks of God in a twofold manner, one, in his majesty as being above time and space, cp. especially Psalms 94, a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday, two, in accordance with our human views as being in time and space. Only in the latter manner is God comprehensible to us. We must so think of God that God, who in his being is immutable, is angry or merciful according to the difference in the object of his affection. We must so conceive of God that in spite of the immutability in his essence he is a gracious God to the humble, poor, and contrite sinners, but a jealous God to the proud and self-righteous, one pet. 5-5, Luke 18 9-14, Luke 1 52-53. God remains immutable, but there is mutability in the objects of his affection. Two objections are frequently raised against God's immutability. It has been said that the creation of the world and the incarnation of the Son imply a change in God. The first objection can be raised only by theosophical pantheists, who view the world as an emanation from God and a part of God's being and deny the creation ex nihilo. Indeed, the creation of the world implies a change, a change, however, not in God, but in relation to the creature. And the second objection can be made only by the canonics. Scripture teaches that the Son of God without any change in his deity has assumed into his person the human nature from the Virgin Mary. 74. 4. The infinity of God, infinitas Dei. All creatures are finite, that is, they are subject to the limits and boundaries of their being and activity. God is infinite. The term infinity expresses the idea that God in his being and activity is in no way bound by the limitations of time and space. Scripture very emphatically ascribes infinity to God both according to his essence, Psalms 145 3, his greatness is unsearchable, and according to his various attributes, Psalms 147 5, his understanding is infinite. Being and attributes in God are one, therefore as God's being is infinite, so are also all his attributes infinite, as will be seen in the discussion of omnipotence, omniscience, etc. In so far as God cannot be measured according to human standards, the infinity of God is also called his immensity. By ascribing immensity to God, Scripture expressly reminds us that we dare not make our puny reason and intellect the yardstick to measure God's being and activity. Scripture says that God dwells in the light which no man can approach unto, 1 Timothy 6:16, and that his greatness is unsearchable, Psalms 145:3, and our confessions, in accord with Scripture, say, God is of infinite power. But Unitarians simply ignore these passages and take the liberty to claim that reason cannot possibly accept three distinct persons in the one indivisible God. It is very necessary that we constantly heed the scriptural emphasis on God's immensity and infinity, lest we ignore the absolute difference between God and man, for we are only too prone to forget our limitations. Man is impressed with his own importance. But God's word, is. 40:15-17. Nations are as a drop of a bucket, as the small dust of the balance, as nothing reduces us to our proper size. Finally, by ascribing infinity and immensity to God, Scripture precludes the notion that God may be confined within a given space in the universe. God is always above space, as Solomon confessed at the dedication of the temple, will God indeed dwell on the earth? Behold, the heaven and heaven of heavens cannot contain thee, how much less this house. 1 Kings 8:27. Accordingly, the axiom is correct and scriptural. God enters into space and time and still always remains above space and time. 5. Omnipresence of God, Omnipresentia Dei. God alone is omnipresent. Man and all creatures are always limited to a specific locality. Not even the angels are omnipresent, for, as Chemnitz says on the basis of Dan. 10 13, one angel is in Persia, another in Greece, Los I. I. 39. Over against the many erroneous views the scriptural teaching on God's omnipresence may be summarized in three points. 1. God is omnipresent according to his essence, not only according to his operation, imminent a day. He is essentially, not only dynamically, omnipresent. In the interest of their false Christology some reformed theologians have denied, and some modern theologians still deny, the essential omnipresence. Wherever God works, he is present. God never works in absentia. Luther God sends out no bailiffs or angels when he creates and preserves a thing, but all that is the direct work of his divine power. But if he is to create and sustain it, 
he must himself be present and must form and sustain his creature, both in its innermost and its outermost parts. Therefore God must be present in every creature in its innermost and its outermost parts, on all sides, through and through, below and above, before and behind. Nothing can be more present and closer to the creature than God himself with his power. Street L. 20 804, in Jeremiah 23 24 God says, Can any hide himself in secret places that I shall not see him? Do not I fill heaven and earth? The point is, God sees everyone, because he is present according to his essence and not only according to his power. The psalmist expresses this same fact, If I ascend up into heaven, thou art there, if I make my bed in hell, behold, thou art there, Psalms 139a. 2. But God's omnipresence is of such a nature that while he is present in all creatures, he is at the same time outside the creature and never becomes the creature or even a part of the creature, transcendentia day. So intimately is God present to all creatures that only in Him can they have life, motion, and being, Acts 17 28, for in Him all things consist, Colossians 1 17. But at the same time He is far outside, and distinct from the creature as the infinite is distinct from the finite. God never partakes of the composite nature of the creature. Gerhard, God is everywhere present, not, so that He is contained, but, so that He comprehends and contains all things, loci, locust and at. Day. Section 172. In connection with the essential omnipresence the question has been raised whether it is proper to think of God as present in unclean places. Erasmus thought it inadvisable to discuss this point publicly, in his diatribe, C Street L. 18 1605. Luther countered that while carnal and vain babblers could not speak of this without giving offense, pious preachers could discuss this in sermons with the proper decorum, in fact, with great benefit. The saints were cast into filthy prisons, even into public sewers. If God were not present there, they could not have called upon Him until they had been transferred from these revolting places into a beautifully decorated temple. But God is everywhere and fills all things. Whoever takes offense at God's presence in filthy places has human and childish ideas of God, he evidently imagines that God, whom the highest heavens cannot contain, is confined by spatial limits. Street L. 18, 1700. 3. God is present everywhere without local extension, contraction, multiplication, or division. These concepts would be applicable to God only if He were subject to the laws of space. According to Scripture, God, though present and active in the world, transcends all space. The transcendence of God is clearly taught in 1 Kings 8 27, is 66 to 1. We would hardly expect that within the Christian church anyone would ascribe local and corporeal extension to God. And yet Zwingli, Calvin, and modern Reformed theologians have actually done this. How else can we account for their apprehension that the human nature of the body of Christ would not be sufficiently large to serve as the body for the fullness of the Godhead, Colossians 2 9. Luther assuages their needless fears, the proud and conceited spirit reveals his crude and doltish ideas when he conceives of God's omnipresence, as though God were a huge, expansive being which fills the universe and even extends beyond it like a straw sack stuffed so full that the straw sticks out at the top and the bottom, in other words, as though God were omnipresent according to the local mode, in a physical and tangible manner. If this were so, then indeed Christ's body would have to be a phantasm or a monster, an immense straw sack, large enough to comprehend God with heaven and earth. Can anyone have such crude and coarse ideas of God? We refuse to say that God is such an extended, long, broad, thick, high, low being. We confess that God is a supernatural, unfathomable being, who at one and the same time is entirely in every little kernel of grain and also in and above and outside all creatures. God cannot be fenced in, as the false spirit dreams. Let him observe this paradox, a human body is much, much too large for the Godhead, in fact, many thousand Godheads could find ample room in one human body, on the other hand, one body is far too small for only one Godhead. Nothing is so small, God is still smaller nothing so large, God is still larger, nothing so short, God is still shorter, nothing so long, God is still longer, nothing so wide, God is still wider, nothing so narrow, God is still narrower, in short, God's being is so far above and beyond words and thought that it is simply indescribable. Street L. 20 960 F. 75. The omnipresence raises several questions, 1, is there space outside of the universe? That is impossible for space is part of the universe, a creature like the universe, and cannot extend beyond itself. Where the universe ends, space also ends. 
To assume space beyond the universe would imply an endless progressus in infinitum and ultimately identify God with the world. Pantheism, but where the universe ends, there God is. The universe, is not in space, but in God, Colossians 1:17. or, as Gerhard expresses it, God is not confined by space. On the contrary, it is he who gives to space and the things contained in space their being. Loci, Locus de Nature Day, Section 172, at Marburg, Zwingli made the claim that every true body must exist locally and spatially.76 But Luther countered that the universe is a true body and still is not in space. 2. Can we assume a special presence of God when he manifests his wrath or love in a special way, specialis approximatio essentiae divini? Quenstead and others answer affirmatively, Systema 2, 92, Bayer and others negatively, Bayer, Compend, 2, 24 SQQ. On the basis of Jeremiah 23 24 and similar passages which teach the essential presence of God in the entire universe, it is safer to side with Bayer. If we assume a special presence of God also according to his essence, we run the risk of transferring the idea of local extension to God. But in any event we must maintain, as did Quenstead and Bayer, that not only God's gifts, but the triune God himself mystically dwells in the believers, John 14 23. This is the statement of the formula of Concord, Trigl. 937, 65. 3. What did God do before the creation of the world? Luther calls this a foolish question and refers to Augustine's reply, God prepared hell for all those who would pry into his secrets, Street L. I colon 13. The doctrine of God's omnipresence is a practical doctrine. 1. It is revealed for our warning, for there is no place where God does not see us, Jeremiah 23 24. No change of address can remove us beyond the reach of his omnipresence, Psalms 139 7 ff. Gerhardt, quite often such things are done under the cover of darkness from which we would recoil in the presence of any upright man. But God is present everywhere, he to whom nothing is hidden and whom no one can deceive. How, then, does it happen that his presence does not fill us with fear and caution lest we transgress? 2. God's omnipresence is consoling. No place or space separates us from his loving protection. We need fear no evil even in the dark valley, Psalms 23 4. Christ is with his disciples unto the end of the world, Matthew 28 20. Gerhardt, even though we are cast into the squalor and darkness of a dungeon for Christ's sake, we can say, The Lord, who is my light and salvation, is with me. Thus saith the Lord that created thee, O Jacob, and he that formed thee, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed thee, I have called thee by thy name, thou art mine. When thou passest through the waters, I will be with thee, and through the rivers, they shall not overflow thee, when thou walkest through the fire, thou shalt not be burned, neither shall the flame kindle upon thee, is. 43-1-2. Loci, Locus Donat. Day, Section 189. 6. The Eternity of God, Eternitas Day. Scripture uses the term eternity in a modified and in an absolute sense. In a modified sense it denotes a long, indefinite period of time, e. g the period of the Old Testament. The children of Israel were to observe the Passover forever, x. 12:24, and circumcision was called, an everlasting covenant. Circumcision and the Passover were to be enforced throughout the Old Testament, but to be abolished with the institution of baptism and the Lord's Supper. 77 The term eternal is used in a modified sense also to denote an existence which, though it has no end, has a beginning. Men and angels are creatures and therefore have a beginning but by the power of God they have no end, and all men and all angels will enter either eternal life or eternal punishment, Matt.25 46. 78. In its strict and absolute sense the word eternity denotes infinite, unlimited duration without beginning, without end, without succession. In this sense, eternity can be predicated only of God.79 God is without beginning, before the mountains were brought forth or ever thou hadst formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, thou art God. Psalms 92. He is without end, thou art the same, and thy years shall have no end, Psalms 102 27. The term eternal is used in scripture to express God's majesty and is used as God's name, Genesis 21 33, the everlasting God, is.4028, everlasting God, Romans 16 26, 1 Tim. 1 17. God's transcendence of time, his eternal presence, is taught in peace. 90-4. A thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past and as a watch in the night. God is the creator of time without becoming temporal. He accompanies time without becoming subject to time or its laws. 
God's relation to time is the same as His relation to space. For though God created space and place and is present everywhere, He does not become local, but remains exalted above space and place. The eternity of God is used in Scripture for our warning and our comfort. There is a punishment with everlasting destruction, from the presence of the Lord, 2 Thessalonians 1 9. 80 But there is also an eternal, presence with the Lord, 1 Thessalonians 4 17, an eternal home in heaven, 2 Corinthians 5 1. 81. b. Positive Attributes. 1. Life, Vita. God alone has life in an absolute sense. Creatures also have life, but it is a derived life, a life in God, Acts 17 28. God, however, has life in Himself, John 5 26. The Scriptures call God the Living God to set forth the majesty of the one true God in contrast to the pagan idols, who are only vanities, Joshua 3 10, Jeremiah 10 10. Acts 14:15, and in contrast to all created life, which has its origin in God, for He giveth to all life and breath, Acts 17:25. According to Scripture the fact that God is the living God is a warning for the godless, for it is a fearful thing to fall into the hands of the living God, Hebrews 10:31. But for the believers it is a comforting fact. The covenant people of the Old Testament, standing on the brink of Jordan, witness that God is indeed a living God, Joshua 3:10 and the New Testament Church is the Church of the Living God, 1 Timothy 3:15 places its trust in the Living God, 1 Timothy 4:10. In days of disaster and despair the Christian exclaims with Luther, vivid. 2. The Knowledge of God, Sciente Day. Knowledge is an attribute common to both God and man. The heathen know God's righteousness, judgment, law, for the work of the law is written into their hearts, Romans 1 32, 2 15. The Christian knows that he is not justified by the deeds of the law, but only through faith in Jesus Christ, Galatians 2:16. Knowledge is an attribute of the evil and the good angels. The devils know a great many things, that there is a God, that Christ is God's Son, that an eternal doom awaits them, James 2:19, Mark 5:12, Matt. 8:29. The knowledge of the good angels is immense. They know the manifold wisdom of God according to the eternal purpose in Christ, Ephesians 3:10-11. They place their intelligence into the service of the Christian Church. Hebrews 1 14, 1 Pet. 1 12, Matt. 4 11, Luke 16 22, Matt. 13 30, 39, 49. The knowledge of creatures is relative, imperfect. God's knowledge is absolute, perfect. The knowledge of God differs from that of creatures in two points, in its extent and in its manner. a. God's knowledge is omniscience, John 21 17. 1 John 3:20 and comprises all things. It includes all future events, which are hidden to creatures and known only to God. Preascientia is 41:22 to 23, and even the contingent events, as whether the people of Caleb would deliver David to Saul if he remained there. 1 Samuel 23:12. What would have happened to Sodom if it had seen the miracles which Christ performed in Capernaum? Matthew 11:23. Scientia de futuro conditionata. 82. B. Man's knowledge is acquired. He progresses from the known to the unknown and from one known fact to another. God's knowledge is not acquired, for he knows all things in one, simple, all comprehensive act. Man acquires his knowledge mediately, for he can learn the nature of things only by a process of perception, induction, deduction, based on a study of observable characteristics and actions of the objects. God, however, knows and discerns the inner nature, the inherent essence of all objects directly and immediately. The old dogmaticians put it thus, God discerns objects not by means of comprehensible characteristics, per species intelligibles, but in their very nature and being. Man looks at things, at spice it, God sees through them, per spice it. Scripture therefore tells us that God knows the thoughts of men even though they do not reveal these thoughts by actions, words, or attitude. God knows the hearts of all the children of men, 1 Kings 8 39, He is the true, Acts 15 8, Christ sees, the thoughts of men. Matthew 9 4, and knows what is in man, John 2 25. What scripture teaches concerning God's knowledge serves for our warning and comfort. It is the prerogative of the divine majesty alone to know future events, is. 41 22 23. All who consult fortune tellers and necromancers, spiritualistic mediums, palm readers, astrologers, transfer God's glory to men and devils. They are an abomination to God and a curse to their country and were therefore put to death under the Old Testament theocracy. Deuteronomy 18:9 FF, Leviticus 26, 27. It is furthermore the prerogative of God alone to know what is in God. 
No man knoweth the Son but the Father, neither knoweth any man the Father save the Son, and he to whomsoever the Son will reveal him. Matthew 11:27. All who teach otherwise and consent not to the wholesome words of Christ, 1 Timothy 6 3, but make their own reason or religious experience the source and standard of truth, dismiss the only competent teacher in the church and usurp his prerogatives. God warns against these self-appointed teachers, hearken not unto the words of the prophets that prophesy unto you, they make you vain, they speak a vision of their own heart and not out of the mouth of the Lord, Jeremiah 23 16. And, finally, we are all only too prone to forget that the all-wise God knows all our thoughts, words, and deeds and that the darkness cannot hide us from Him, for the night shineth as the day, and darkness and light are both alike to Him, Psalms 139 12. But Scripture shows us also how to employ God's omniscience for our comfort in spiritual and physical needs. God knows those who have a contrite heart, who tremble at His word, is. 66-2, and He delights to dwell with them in His grace, is. 57-15. Psalms 34 18, 51 17. Our Heavenly Father knows our physical wants and needs, Matthew 6 32. He knows the righteousness of our cause when the enemies of the truth malign and persecute us, Psalm 17 3. A number of problems confront the philosopher who attempts to analyze the omniscience of God. The most vexing problem is, what is the relation of the infallible prescience of God to human freedom and responsibility? If there is an infallible foreknowledge of God, then everything must happen as God has foreknown it. If that is true, then there can be no human freedom of action and, of course, no human responsibility. This is the position of some pagan philosophers, 83 of the Socinians, 84 as well as some modern theologians. They have denied God's omniscience entirely, at least in reference to the wicked deeds of men. In answering this problem scripture teaches us to observe three things. 1. God's prescience extends over all things and is infallible. Everything happens as God has foreknown it. The opposite assumption would abolish the true conception of God. 85. 2. Though the omniscience of God extends over all things without exception, it is not the efficient cause of the things which it knows. In the light of Scripture, when God views a thing abstractly, notional leader, he always views it as already existing. Thus we read in Psalms 139 1 4, O Lord, thou hast searched me and known me. Thou knowest my downsitting and mine uprising. Thou understandest my thought afar off. Thou compassest my path and my lying down, and art acquainted with all my ways, for there is not a word in my tongue, but, lo, O Lord, Thou knowest it altogether. When God through His messenger announces to the Laodicean congregation that He knows its works, that it is neither cold nor hot, Revelation 3:15, this divine knowledge does not affect the side conditions at Laodicea, but views them as already existing. In describing God's omniscience the formula of Concord says very correctly, the foreknowledge of God, preescientia, foresees and foreknows also that which is evil, however, not in such a manner as though it were God's gracious will that it should happen. However, the beginning and cause of evil is not God's foreknowledge, for God does not create and effect, or work, evil, neither does he help or promote it, but the wicked, perverse will of the devil and of men, is the cause of evil. Trig. 1065. 6 to 7 and the epitome for the foreknowledge of god is nothing else than that god knows all things before they happen trig 833 3 but there is also a knowledge on the part of god which is causative it differs from the omniscience in two respects this unique and special knowledge extends over only a certain definite number of objects not over all things good and evil and second it causes and affects the object of god's foreknowledge it was this knowledge which selected israel as the chosen race you only have I known of all the families of the earth, Amos 3 2, which converted the Galatians, who were known of God, Galatians 4 9. This is the so-called noscom effect to effect or the pregnant use of the term to know. 86. 3. There seems to be an irreconcilable contradiction between the first and the second statement, even when we define God's foreknowledge as nothing else than that God knows all things before they occur, formula of Concord. Can we maintain God's infallible foreknowledge and also human freedom and responsibility? Reason argues, if it is true, as indeed it is true, that all things must happen as God has foreseen them, then we must either join Cicero, the Socinians, et alia and sacrifice the infallible and absolute omniscience or become Stoics and deny the freedom of who in action and man's responsibility for his sin. But on the basis of Scripture we must maintain both, even though in this life we cannot harmonize the apparent contradictions. The formula of Concord suggests the only possible mode of procedure, 1, we must firmly believe that everything must happen as God has foreknown it, 2, 
we dare not trouble ourselves with what God may have foreknown concerning ourselves and others. Because we would then enter the realm of the unrevealed and inscrutable mysteries of God. 3. We must use the means of grace to which God has directed us. Thus there is no doubt that God most exactly and certainly foresaw, prevederit, before the time of the world, and still knows, which of those that are called will believe or will not believe, also which of the converted will persevere, in faith, and which will not persevere, which will return after a fall, into grievous sins, and which will fall into obduracy, will perish in their sins. So, too, the number, how many there are of these on either side, is beyond all doubt perfectly known to God. However, since God has reserved this mystery for His wisdom, and has revealed nothing concerning it to us in His Word, much less commanded us to investigate it with our thought, but has earnestly discouraged us therefrom, Rom. 1133 FF, we should not reason in our thoughts, draw conclusions, nor inquire curiously into these matters, but should adhere to His revealed Word, to which He points us. Trig. 1081, 54 F, this practice is not a scientific solution of the problem. But is it not more scientific frankly to admit one's ignorance than to deceive oneself and others with a counterfeit solution or with the impossible promise of a final solution after further exploration? 87. A second problem is stated as follows, since there is no past or future with God, how can we speak of God's prescientia? Answer, God ascribes prescience to himself, is. 4610 but he does so to conform to our mode of thinking. Being in time and subject to its laws of temporal sequence, we cannot conceive of timelessness, of God's eternal today, of an ever-present moment. We think only in terms of the past, the present, the future, and therefore God condescends to our concepts of time. In this sense he with whom there is no future ascribes to himself a knowledge which in distinction from all human wisdom extends also to future events.88. Finally, the question is frequently asked whether foreknowledge may not also be ascribed to man, his disembodied spirit, and angels. The scriptural answer is a definite no. Foreknowledge is the exclusive property of the divine majesty. Furthermore, scripture expressly affirms that man does not know the future, for example, the time of the last judgment, Matthew 24 36. When man, as Daniel, Dan. 2 27-28, 45, or angels, as Gabriel, Luke 1 19 foretold future events, they did so by a special revelation for a specific purpose. Man's so-called prophecies are at best conjecture or a prognostication based on calculations. Fortune-tellers who claim to foretell the future are the mediums of the devils, for the good angels will never become guilty of such a blasphemous encroachment upon God's prerogative. 3. The Wisdom of God, Sapientia Dei. Scripture makes a distinction between God's wisdom and His knowledge, Romans 11:33 the depth of the riches both of the wisdom and knowledge of God. The two words are not synonymous when applied to God. From God's viewpoint there is no distinction between the various divine attributes, for they constitute His indivisible essence itself. Since the human mind cannot comprehend God in His absolute unity, God reveals Himself for our sake in separate attributes. This fact compels us to differentiate also between wisdom and knowledge, especially in view of the fact that, not only coordinate, but also differentiate the and the. Likewise in 1 Corinthians 12 8 a distinction is made between the two gifts of the Holy Spirit and in scripture the term wisdom, sapientia, denotes a practical knowledge, 89 the ability to discern correctly the best ends and choose the best means for attaining these ends. And in this sense, scripture ascribes wisdom to God. God reveals this wisdom not only in the realm of nature by the acts of creation and preservation, Psalms 104 24, but also in the realm of grace by his counsel and acts concerning our salvation. The Gospel of Christ crucified is expressly called, the wisdom of God, the hidden wisdom which God ordained before the world unto our glory. 1 Corinthians 2 6 ff. Since God is the only wise God, 1 Tim. 1 17, Romans 16 27, and since man is totally unable to fathom the depths of his unsearchable wisdom, Romans 11 33, we dare never criticize God's wisdom, but must stand before it in adoration and praise. By nature we are only too prone to criticize God in His works and to elevate our own puny wisdom above God's unsearchable wisdom. This is true particularly of liberal theology, where a carping and censorious spirit, under the pretense of a scientifically critical method, has gained complete control. Modern theologians challenge God's wisdom especially a, in their claim that Scripture is not the inviolable truth of God, and b, in the rejection of the vicarious atonement as too mechanical, juridical as unethical and even detrimental to morals.90 because of the old Adam even the Christian at times criticizes the ways of God. 
but in spite of the modernist and the old Adam in the Christian, the scriptural truth cannot be challenged that not only in a general way, but in every detail everything in this world is taking the right course. It cannot be otherwise, for all things are controlled by the expert hand of the all-wise God. This includes also all the punishments, e. g. famines, wars, depressions, earthquakes, floods, with which God allows mankind to be afflicted, General 3:16 ff, Matt. 24 colon 1 ff. They must serve God's gracious purpose and will to bring men to repentance and faith, as Christ expressly teaches on the basis of concrete examples in Luke 13 1 ff. 4. The attributes of the divine will. The scriptures ascribe to God not only mind, Romans 11:34, who hath known the mind of the Lord, but also will, 1 Tim. 2 4, who will have all men to be saved, John 6 40, 1 Thessalonians 4 3 the will of God concerning our salvation and our sanctification. The remaining positive attributes may be viewed as being related to God's will and include His holiness, justice, truth, power, benevolence, mercy, love, grace, and long-suffering. Before we discuss the various attributes of God's will, two questions must be answered. 1. Do causes influence God's will? 2. Is a classification of the divine will permissible? 1. The first question must be answered as follows. A. Scripture, on the one hand, describes God in His majesty. As the God of majesty He is independent of all things, is absolute and unconditioned, Romans 11:36. of Him and through Him and to Him are all things. It is therefore impossible to ascribe to God in His majesty cause and effect as two separate and distinct concepts. Non sunt in Deo cause formaliter cause andes, b, Scripture, on the other hand, compels us to make a distinction between cause and effect in God because we are unable to comprehend the absolute God. Scripture therefore teaches us to view God's wrath as being caused by man's sin, Psalms 97-8, Jeremiah 2-19, and God's grace is resting upon Christ's merit, Romans 3-24, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus. In Deo Sunt Cause A Virtualiter Cause Andes.91. 2. There can be no division and classification of God's will as far as God's essence is concerned. In Him there is only one will and this is identical with his essence. But because of our finite comprehension scripture itself teaches us to observe the following classification and divisions. a. We distinguish between God's first, or antecedent, and second, or consequent, will, volunteers prima, sive antecedents, et volunteers secunda, sive consequence. According to John 3:17, we must first think of God as not willing to condemn a single person, but that he earnestly wills the salvation of everyone. Then we must secondly think of God that He wills the condemnation of all who reject Christ, for in v. 18 we read, He that believeth not is condemned already. The distinction between the antecedent and the consequent will has been misused in the interest of synergism since Chrysostom's days. But we must maintain this distinction because it is scriptural and because Calvinism denies it by ascribing to God in His relation to lost mankind two independent and contradictory wills. b. We must distinguish between an irresistible and a resistible will in God. Voluntas irresistibilis et voluntas resistibilis. God in His majesty cannot be resisted. No one can resist Christ's will which will summon all men before the judgment throne. There is a divine must, behind this will, John 5 28, Matt. 25 31 ff, 2 Corinthians 5 10, we must, appear. But Christ's will to bring men to faith through the preaching of the gospel can be resisted, Matt. 23 37, ye would not. This distinction has been misused by ancient and modern synergists, who argue that the ability to resist implies the ability to assist and who therefore ascribe to the natural man faculties say applicandi ad gratium, self-determination. c. God wills immediately and immediately, voluntas absoluta et voluntas ordinata. At Cana, Christ made wine without employing the usual means for making wine, John 2 1-11. In exceptional cases, so-called reserved cases, God works immediately even in the kingdom of grace, as is evident from the fact that John was endowed with the Holy Ghost in his mother's womb, Luke 1 15, 41. But God's usual order is that he works faith, preservation of faith, sanctification, etc., only through the means of grace which he has appointed and to which he has bound us, Romans 10 17, Titus 3 5, 1 Pet. 1 23 ff, Mark 16 15, Matt. 28 19-20. When enthusiasts appeal to Luke 1:15, they misapply this text. Enthusiasm in all its forms perverts the divine order. D. God's will is unconditioned by any human effort as well as conditioned by human efforts, 
Voluntas gratia et voluntas conditionata. In the realm of grace, God's rule is not contingent upon man's good works, for man is saved by grace without the deeds of the law, Romans 3:28. by grace alone, Ephesians 2 8-10, Romans 11 6. All who endeavor to supplement the will of grace by human effort will receive the curse, Galatians 3 10. In the realm of the law, however, God's will is conditioned by man's work. This do, and thou shalt live, Luke 10 28, Gal. 3 12. But let no one who hopes to be saved in this way forget that the will of God is conditioned by nothing less than a perfect fulfillment of the entire law, for cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of the law to do them, Galatians 3 10. E. Scripture distinguishes between God's revealed and His hidden will, voluntas revelata, voluntas signi, and voluntas obscondita, voluntas beneplacity. On the one hand, Christians know God's will, they know the things that are freely given us of God, they judge all things and know the mind of Christ, 1 Cor. 2 12, 15-16. On the other hand, it is also true that no man knows the mind of the Lord, Romans 11 33-34. In all matters of their salvation men are directed solely to the gracious will of God, which is revealed in Christ and clearly taught in all those passages which tell us that God can and will be known only in Christ, John 1 18, Matt. 17 5. John 6 40, and that salvation can be found only in Christ, Matthew 11:28. 28. Theologians find fault with Luther because he first makes a distinction between the hidden and the revealed wills of God, and then in matters of salvation completely ignores the hidden will, since it is unsearchable and directs our attention solely to the revealed will. This procedure, they say, is an act of violence in the realm of reason, Gualduct. 92 The fact is that Luther's procedure is that of the scriptures, 1 Cor. 2 12, 15 to 16, Romans 11 33 to 34. 93. We are now ready to discuss the positive attributes of God that may be viewed as relating to God's will. a. The holiness of God, sanctity is day. The holiness of God denotes one. God's supreme majesty and absolute transcendence. The basic meaning of in the Trisayan, is. 6 to 3, is separate, removed, exalted. God is the Holy One, is. 43, 3, 14, etc., the absolutely remote. Though He permeates and fills all things, He is exalted above all creatures, sits upon a throne, high and lifted up, before whom the seraphim cover their face and feet. The New Testament equivalent of, John 12:41. In its first meaning the holiness of God describes God in his essence and therefore includes all his attributes. 94 The Holy One of Israel and the God of Israel are unequivocal synonyms, Psalm 71 22. 2. The term holiness denotes also the absolute ethical purity of God. As the Holy God he is separate from sin, and his holiness includes his contrast and opposition to man's sin. Be ye holy, for I am holy, 1 Pet. 1 16, cp. Leviticus 11 44-45. 19 to 2, 20 to 7. Isaiah was fully conscious of the fact that the revelation of God's holiness brought God's absolute purity into sharp contrast with his own and his people's sin. V. 5. Woe is me. For I am undone, etc. Modern theology denies in part or in whole this twofold definition of God's holiness. 95. The revelation of God's holiness teaches us two important lessons. In the first place, we must enter into his presence with deep awe and great reverence. Jehovah's throne is an awful throne, before which we are, as Abraham said, nothing but dust and ashes. Genesis 18:27 ff. But, secondly, we can come into his presence with confidence and joy, because the holiness of God has been perfectly appeased through Christ's vicarious atonement, Romans 5 1, 10, Ephesians 3 11 12. b. The justice of God, Iustitia Dei. The scriptures ascribe justice to God and thereby exclude all unrighteousness from God's being. Psalms 92 15, the Lord is upright, and there is no unrighteousness in him, and especially Deuteronomy 32 4, which abounds in predicates denoting justice, he is the rock, his work is perfect, for all his ways are judgment, a God of truth and without iniquity, just and right is he. If we attempt to comprehend God's righteousness according to our mode of thinking, we encounter an insurmountable difficulty. Man is just when his actions conform to the law of his divine superior. But since God has no superior and therefore no fixed norm, can we really predicate righteousness of Him? This apparent difficulty is resolved in the scriptural axiom coined by the scholastics and used by Luther, Deus est ex lex. God is outside the law. He is just, because He wills and does everything in conformity with His own law. Luther, God issues His law to others, 
but he does not apply it as a norm to himself. 96. In its relation to man, God's justice is one, Iustitia legalize, the divine righteousness revealed in the law, and two, Iustitia evangelica, the righteousness revealed in the gospel. The former is legislative, inasmuch as it is the standard for man's moral being and actions and demands absolute conformity with this norm. Matthew 22 37, it is remunerativa, inasmuch as it rewards the good, and it is vindicativa, punitiva, ultrix, inasmuch as it punishes the evil. 2 Thessalonians 1 4 10. The Iustitia Evangelica is the very opposite. It consists in God's setting aside as Iustitia legalize, declaring the sinner righteous, forgiving his sin by grace for the sake of Christ's righteousness. Romans 3 21 22. The righteousness of God without the law is manifested the righteousness of God which is by faith of Jesus Christ. Man's salvation rests solely on the Iustitia Evangelica, and faith in this evangelical justice constitutes the essence of Christianity. Here we have the answer to the question whether God punishes sin adequately. According to Galatians 3.13, John 3.36, etc., Christ bore the adequate punishment of sin in our place, and whoever rejects this full and complete payment must pay it himself eternally. C. The truthfulness of God, veracitous day. Men put little faith in what God says. They believe neither God's threats in the law, Psalms 90 11, nor his promises in the gospel, is. 53 to 1, John 12 38. But this distrust and disbelief frustrates God's gracious purpose to save man. Therefore God does not hesitate to assure us in his word that he is not a liar like men, but the absolute truth. Romans 3 4, Let God be true, but every man a liar. According to God's record man's veracity score is zero. Not only does scripture characterize some peoples and persons as past masters at lying, e. g. the Cretans, Titus 1:12, but Christ declares that the whole human race is inherently dishonest, deceitful, mendacious. Out of the heart, the inner being, proceed false witnesses and blasphemies, Matthew 15:19. And David states, all men are liars, Psalms 116:11. Over against this universal dishonesty of man, Scripture repeatedly places the absolute truthfulness of God into the sharpest possible antithesis, Titus 1 2, John 3 33, Hebrews 6 18, 1 Sam. 15 29, Numbers 23 19, God's words can therefore never pass away, Matthew 24 35, John 10 35, the scripture cannot be broken. The absolute truthfulness of God in his wrath as well as in his grace should, on the one hand, arouse men from their carnal security for God will not be mocked, Galatians 6 7, and, on the other hand, incite them to trust God's gracious promises unconditionally, Romans 10 11, Titus 1 2, eternal life, which God, that cannot lie, promised. d. The power of God, potentia day. The power of God differs from the power of creatures both in the manner and in the extent of its activity. Concerning the mode, Scripture teaches us to say that God effects His works by an act of the will. 97 God creates by His will, by His fiat, Genesis 1 3. God's will is God's power, what He wills, He does, Psalms 115 3. In regard to the extent of God's power, the Scriptures say that with God all things are possible, Matthew 19 26, or, stated more emphatically in a double negative, with God nothing shall be impossible, Luke 1 37. God is omnipotent. How foolish to entertain the pantheistic and rationalistic idea that in the work of creation God exhausted his power and reached the limit of his creative capacity. But it is just as foolish when men take the liberty to determine not only what God's omnipotence may do, but also what it actually has done. God's word alone answers that question, and man has no right to say that God in his omnipotence forgives sin without the vicarious atonement, because he has revealed to us that we have forgiveness only in Christ's redemption, Romans 3:24. Whatever God wills he accomplishes in one of two ways, either by his appointed means, causa secunde, potentia ordinata, or without them, potentia absoluta, immediata. In either case, however, the one and self-same divine power is operative. The same divine omnipotence is at work when God according to his established order sustains life by food and drink or immediately, as he sustained Moses for forty days without meat or drink, x. 34 28. Thou feedest us from year to year. Him 569 to 8. All those works which God performs without employing the usual means, causa secunde, are defined in scriptures as miracles, John 2 11, Acts 2 43. Two points must be observed in considering miracles 1. God is not bound to observe the distinction between potentia absoluta and ordinata, in other words, 
he can do without means what he ordinarily does through means, x. 34:28. God is above the laws of nature and can therefore dispense with them at will, as Christ teaches, man shall not live by bread alone, but by every word that proceedeth out of the mouth of God, Matthew 4 4. Strictly speaking, there are no immutably fixed laws of nature. They exist only in the foolish minds of mechanistic philosophers and evolutionistic theorizers. In reality the laws of nature are nothing more than the will of God as applied to the creature. 2. God has bound us to the appointed means. We shall leave the performance of miracles to God. Of course, there is a miracle working faith, wonder glob, fides heroica, Matt. 1720, 2121, 1 Corinthians 12 1, 10, which is not bound to rules. He that has this gift knows when to use it. 98. The objection that God is not omnipotent because he cannot die, lie, steal, etc., does not emanate from genuine motives, such as spiritual afflictions or an honest quest for the truth. In the final analysis the objection is nothing but a sophistical denial of God's essence, in which will and power are one. It does not merit refutation. 99. e. God's goodness, mercy, love, grace, long-suffering, patience, bonitas, misericordia, amor, gratia, long onimitas, patientia day. The close relation of these attributes makes it advisable to treat them under one heading. 100. On the basis of scriptures the dogmaticians distinguish between the objective and subjective goodness of God. Viewed objectively, goodness is that quality in God whereby He is the absolute good, the unconditioned and essential perfection. Scripture ascribes goodness to creatures not only before the fall, Genesis 1:31, very good, but also after the fall, 1 Tim. 4 4, every creature of God is good. But creatures are good only in so far as they are God's creation. God alone is good of himself and in himself, and in this sense there is none good but one, that is, God, Matthew 19:17. God's goodness and absolute perfection are the same. Gerhard, God is really good, he alone is good, and he is the cause of all goodness, loci, locust and at. Day, section 208. 101. There is a very important lesson in the truth that God alone is good in himself whereas all human goodness is only a derived goodness. This truth will guard us against pride when we observe special gifts in ourselves not bestowed on others, and against envy when the situation is reversed. Scripture and experience teach us that pride and envy have always been the great troublemakers in the church and in the state. Scripture warns against pride, 1 Corinthians 4 7, and against envy, 1 Pet. 2-1. Gerhard, all good gifts come down to us and our neighbors from God. Whoever therefore is envious of the neighbor has a quarrel with God, the giver of the gifts, and is in reality a, one who picks a fight with God. Op. CIT, Section 215. God's goodness is not only remote, objective, an attribute within the divine essence, but it is also subjective, relative, an attribute which describes God's benevolence and beneficence toward his creatures. 102 Scripture contains many references concerning God's goodness toward all creatures, rational and irrational, the Lord is good to all. Psalms 145 9. Has pity even on animals, Jonah 4 11, helps both man and beast, Psalms 36 6, and especially Psalm 136, with its refrain, For his mercy endureth forever. For this reason the psalmist calls on all creatures to praise God, Psalm 148. But scripture focuses our attention in particular on God's goodness toward man, more specifically, toward man as a sinner. It does so by using the terms mercy, love, grace, patience, long-suffering. These terms are, of course, synonyms, inasmuch as they all describe God's goodness. But from our viewpoint they present various aspects of God's goodness, and these synonymous terms bring God's goodness into full view, just as the various facets refract and reflect the brilliance of the diamond. The mercy of God is goodness is compassion upon man, whose sin has brought him into untold misery. Through the tender mercy of God, the dayspring, Christ, hath visited us, to give light to them that sit in darkness and in the shadow of death, Luke 1 78-79. The love of God shows us that facet of God's goodness which reveals him as being deeply attached to sinful mankind and anxious to restore men to communion with God, John 3 16 God is the philanthropist, whose love toward man, has appeared, Titus 3 4. The grace of God is goodness in so far as man in no wise has deserved it, but God is good toward the sinner only for the sake of Christ's vicarious satisfaction, Titus 3 5 not by works of righteousness which we have done, Romans 3:24. freely, by His grace, through the redemption that is in Christ Jesus.
the terms patience and long-suffering reveal that phase of God's goodness which prompts him not to punish immediately, but to wait for the sinner's repentance. He waited for 120 years before the flood, 1 Pet. 320, and the postponement of the world's final judgment is due not to God's slackness, but to his long-suffering, which earnestly desires that all should come to repentance, 2 Pet. 3-9. God characterizes himself as the Lord God, merciful and gracious, long-suffering and abundant in goodness and truth, x. 34-6. 103. The repeated occurrence of great catastrophes, such as earthquakes, floods, wars, panics, is viewed by some as denying God's goodness. But these ravages are employed by God in the interest of his saving goodness. They are a call to repentance to all men, Luke 13 3, 5. Therefore we observe a day of penitence after such catastrophes. Unfortunately the vast majority remains impenitent and compels God to complain, why should ye be stricken any more? Ye will revolt more and more, the whole head is sick, and the whole heart is faint, is. 1 to 5. God's goodness must be reflected in his children. Be ye therefore merciful, as your father also is merciful, Luke 6 36. Christians are taught of God to love one another, 1 Thessalonians 4 9. They love, bless, help, and intercede for their enemies that they may be children of their heavenly Father, Matthew 5 44-45. They are kind to one another, forgiving, tender-hearted, even as God for Christ's sake has forgiven them, Ephesians 4 32, Colossians 3 13. God's goodness toward the dumb creatures must also reflect itself in the Christian, for a righteous man regardeth the life of his beast, but the tender mercies, the heart, marginal reading, of the wicked are cruel, Proverbs 12:10. Among all the attributes of God, Scripture assigns a unique place to God's goodness as grace in Christ. We must always keep in mind that the true scope of the Bible is none other than to reveal God's grace. For Scripture reveals Christ the Savior of sinners, and in Christ's redemptive work God turns His gracious countenance toward sinners. For God sent not His Son into the world to condemn the world, but that the world through Him might be saved, John 3 17. Also the Old Testament has no other scope than to reveal the forgiveness of sins in Christ, I e, God's grace, as St. Peter testifies, to him give all the prophets witness that through his name whosoever believeth in him shall receive remission of sins, Acts 10:43. If Scripture had revealed all the divine attributes except God's grace, then Scripture would be of no value to us. Our knowledge of God would fill our hearts with terror if Scripture had not revealed that the one, indivisible, immutable, infinite, omnipresent, eternal, living, all-knowing, all-wise, omnipotent, holy, just, truthful God is also the gracious God, gracious in Christ and for Christ's sake. All sins thou borest for us, else a despair reigned o'er us. This is God's true countenance. Let us take heed lest we deface God's gracious countenance. Rome defaces it in a very coarse way by coldly making the doctrine of work righteousness its central doctrine and by expressly pronouncing the anathema on the doctrine of justification through faith in God's grace for Christ's sake.104 in the papacy. God's gracious countenance is transformed into the countenance of an angry judge. Luther complains that as a result of the papal system of work righteousness he had feared Christ more than the devil. God's gracious countenance is distorted also in some sections of the Protestant Church, though not so patently as in Rome, yet just as seriously. Calvinism emphasizes the sovereignty of God in such a one-sided manner that the countenance of grace is virtually obliterated. Synergism, ancient and modern in so far as it makes man's salvation depend on some good quality in man, thereby actually places the mask of a cruel and vindictive judge over the loving face of our gracious Father. The same is done by the modern theologians who deny the satisfactio vicariat.105 but only too often even Christians who clearly understand the doctrine of God's grace and are also able to state it correctly, deface God's gracious countenance. This occurs when they attempt to determine God's gracious attitude toward themselves on the basis of their subjective feelings and emotions and not on the basis of the objective word of God.106. In concluding our discussion of the doctrine of God we must once more point out that all who deny the Holy Trinity know nothing of God's gracious countenance. If there is no Trinity, then there is no eternal Son of God, no incarnation of the Son of God in the fullness of time, no vicarious atonement, no justification by faith, no peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ then there is only the law, with its obligations, demands, threats, and curses. The triune God is the gracious God, and the gracious God is the triune God. One concerning the use of, the New Testament employs to denote the cause or source from which something is known, as in Matt. 7:16, by their fruits, ye shall know them, and also as a temporal preposition, as in Matt. 
1904, which made them at, the beginning. Luther takes in the first sense, and der Schopf von der Welt. We accept Luther's rendition because it fits well into the context, and classical Greek suggests it, as, for example, Aristotle. The exegetes are not agreed. Two de mundo, cap. Phi. Three de non vetus, tam and de 